Welcome to worship at Village Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you have chosen to join us in this time. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we particularly welcome you and include you as part of this gathered faith community. We at Village, we value relationship. We're committed to mission. Uh, we partner with you in making sense of our lives from a perspective of faith in these days. Wherever you are in your faith journey or in your life, we endeavor to meet you there. Let me invite you to check out the upcoming events link on our homepage here at villagepress.org. Uh, there you'll see information about, uh, well, upcoming events, ministry opportunities in which we invite you to participate. You'll see our second Thursday recital is listed there by, with organist Thomas Lazella. We invite you to tune in for that. Uh, hey, Saturday, bring the kiddos by. We have a family fun uh, drive through. Come by and get an Easter craft bag uh, uh, provided by our children's ministry. Also this week, our faith and grief gatherings continue. You know, these are just a few of the things that, that you make possible by making a financial contribution to the ministry of this church family. So before the day ends, I invite you to do so on the webpage or however you normally do it, but to make a contribution that our ministry in this community might remain vital and strong. But first, as we begin this time, let us remind ourselves that we're not alone, but that we are a gathered community. Send a text or email to a friend passing the peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Hi, we're Ron. And Jan Witzke. May, May the peace of Christ be with you. 
Could it be that everything in all of your life and all of creation has been crescendoing to this moment? This moment is just one moment among many, you might be thinking. It's just, this is just one day of 365 in the year 2021. What's so special about this moment? And this is just one worship service out of many. This is just one moment in time, yet. What we know deep inside of us is that God has been calling us to worship since the moment time began, since the moment God's love conceived of us, God has been calling us to worship. So today, this day, we will be God will be bringing us just to the edge of chaos and will be revealing God's self anew to us. Thoughts and visions that were unthinkable and unknowable before will be revealed to us. So yes, everything in your life, in my life, in our world, in our universe has been pulling us towards this moment the moment when we begin to worship God. Amen.
morning, kids. Come on in here for our little time together. Hey, this morning, Pastor Tom is going to talk with us about another one of those Beatitudes. And remember, they each talk about a group of people Jesus describes as blessed. This one today is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hmm. When I think about hunger, I think about food. And I love good food. Pizza, milkshakes, french fries. You guys with me? I love food so much that I film this children's time from my kitchen every week. Well, I asked some friends of mine at Village what foods they love. Let's hear what they have to say. Is my mommy's soup and I like it because it's creamy, dreamy, and delicious. It has it has squash, potatoes, and carrots in it. We usually eat it with some kale in the middle, and we you, and also sometimes we eat it with baguette. And I love it because it's delicious. I like my lemons because those are sour and I like them and those are delicious and sweet. My favorite food, sub sandwiches. I love the juicy tomatoes, the fresh lettuce, and the really cool turkey. And I love the Munchie cheese and provolone. And it just makes mwah, lunch. Man, you guys, now I'm really hungry. Well, when I was a kid, I loved chocolate chip cookies. And we had this cookie jar in our kitchen. When no one was in there, I used to maybe sneak some cookies. I'd grab a couple when no one was looking. My brothers didn't get any extra cookies, but I didn't really care that it was fair. I just wanted my cookies because I was hungry. So when Jesus talks about hunger and thirst for righteousness, he's not talking about food, is he? So what is this righteousness he's talking about? Well, it's being good and being fair and doing the right thing. It's a hunger, but not just for chocolate chip cookies. It's a hunger for doing the right thing, the fair thing, the loving thing. And you know what he says about these people? The ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness? He says they'll be filled. That's pretty cool, huh? I'm noticing that in these Beatitudes, Jesus names something that people are searching for. And then in the next breath, he says they will get exactly what they need. So the people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, they'll be filled. Pretty awesome, huh? Jesus knows exactly what we need. And he loves to provide what we're searching for. That's why he keeps calling these people blessed. Because Jesus loves to meet our weakness with his strength. The greatest blessing of all. Let's say a little repeat after me prayer together. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for providing exactly what we need. We are so grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome Sunday, you guys. So good to see you. Let us pray.
Gracious God, we come to you today to pray the prayers of the people, all of your people. At the foot of the cross, Mary kneels and weeps, remembering the cries of your people. In that same way, we come to you today remembering the prayers of your people. We remember those who are thirsting for food and water. We ask that you may feed them. We remember your people who find themselves without a home. May you find them shelter. We remember your people who are ill and dying. May you give them comfort. We remember all of those who work for justice. May you give them strength. We remember the cries of your people who do not even know that they are your people. Yet, O oh God, you are the one who gives us hope. You have given us redemption in Jesus Christ, and in that hope we pray for your promised new day. So we express our gratitude for the saving works you have shown to us already. We are grateful for all the ways you feed your people through the food banks and meal trains and gift cards and bringing meals to friends. We are grateful for the ways that you shelter your people through shelters, through camps, through homes and couches. We are grateful for the ways that you comfort your people through pastors, Stephen ministers, telecare callers, Presbyterian women's circles, Sunday school classes, and even the simple card we send in the mail. We are grateful for the ways that you strengthen your people, O oh God, through Bible studies, classes, calling us to prayer, calling us to worship, giving financial gifts, sitting on committees, leading us through transformation and change, and so much more. We are grateful, O oh God, that your vision, that your divine vision is broader than our own mortal vision and that you can see needs that we cannot. Finally, O oh God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us the way. He also taught us how to pray. So let us now pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this, this day continues with the Beatitudes. They're found in the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to be reading verses 2 through 6 as we come to this passage. First, join me in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, it is your word and your word alone that is life for us. And because you are gracious, we trust you will speak to us. We are here, O oh God. We are listening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Then Jesus began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know in every moment just how much they need God. Blessed are those who mourn, 
who recognize all that is wrong in them and in the world and grieve for God's ultimate healing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Righteousness Righteousness is not pursued very often in our culture today. It seems to me we have lost our hunger for righteousness. That means, that means it's more important for communities of faith like ours to pursue a diet of righteousness. It was years ago, Carol and I, we took kids, put them in the car, and we went to, among a a number of places, we went to the Grand Canyon. We took our children to the Grand Canyon. We had never been before. It was was breathtaking. We asked around and found a trail less traveled, and we hiked largely by ourselves down toward the base of the canyon. There we ate a sandwich, and then we came back up for our lodging. It was a great day. And the only thing that would have made it better is had we taken enough water to drink. Uh, We didn't. By the time we got back to our car, I was parched. I was so thirsty that I was beginning to get a headache. You've probably had that experience. Uh, The thing about hunger and thirst is they are first-tier concerns. You don't push those off and address other needs or other interests. When we're really hungry, really thirsty, they, those needs rise to the top. Jesus says the truly blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. So what does it mean to thirst for righteousness? For righteousness to be your first desire. Let me offer a couple of reflections. The first is the hunger for righteousness begins by recognizing the lack of righteousness that is in the world. If you heard our message last week, blessed are those who mourn, there's there's an echo of that beatitude here in this one. Those who hunger for righteousness, they, they trust that God's dreams for us in the world, they are reliable, but they're not fulfilled yet. And so they hunger, they yearn, they thirst for God's dreams, for what God wants for you and me and for the world to be a reality. Of course, the truth is, we don't always want what God wants. It's a pretty high bar. But I think we at least want to want what God wants. When we do, when we want what God wants, it makes us hunger for righteousness. It makes us hunger for things to be different. So I recently enjoyed John Meacham's book, His Truth is Marching On. It's a biography of John Lewis. When Lewis died last summer, we lost someone who I think embodied this beatitude. Meacham says there was a moment in the civil rights movement when the Freedom Riders, you remember that? The Freedom Riders, they were traveling through the South. They had moved into Alabama, and there were threats of violence that had escalated to the point that that most people were pretty sure that if the buses pulled out the next day, somebody would die. Uh, President Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy sent emissaries to meet with the Freedom Riders to beg them to, to call it off. It's just not safe. Someone's going to die if you continue. And the Freedom Riders agreed. But John Lewis didn't. John Lewis and a woman named Diane Nash and others, they were in Nashville, and they drove through the night to meet the Freedom Riders in Alabama, and they got on the buses the next day, and they continued the rides, even though they were pretty sure someone might die that day. 
And Meacham said this. He said, John and the others, they weren't thinking pragmatically. They weren't even thinking rationally. For their thoughts were shaped not by the fears of the world that they knew, but by the hopes of the one they were seeking. They were living toward God's promised day, as we would say it here, no matter the cost, with thoughts shaped less by fears of the world that they knew and more by hopes of the world they were seeking. That's what it looks like to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to want the wrongs of the world to be set right. It's a high bar. Quite frankly, it's not one I live up to very often. But in this season of Lent, in this season of Lent, we reflect on the status of our own discipleship. Now, the purpose of that is not to shame any of us. There's no point in that. No, the purpose of Lent is inspiration, to, to point to the lives of goodness that we can see in the world and in the, in the community of faith to see if that might inspire greater goodness even in us. Viktor Frankl, he was a psychotherapist and he also survived several Nazi concentration camps. And Frankl, he once said, decent people are the minority in the human family, but they inspire us to the greatness of decency. I think Frankel has an important insight. You know, none of us is decent, none of us is faithful all the time. We all stumble, but when Jesus gives his life to teach us what it would look like to live a blessed life, what it would look like to live toward the kingdom of heaven. He's inviting us to be defined not by our failings and what's wrong with us, but be defined by His grace that it might inspire decency, that it might inspire a hunger for righteousness. You know, righteousness is an important word in faith. And it's one that we should reflect on. To be righteous is obviously enough to pursue what is right. That's hard. It's important work to pursue what is right. But righteousness is more than that. Righteousness is more than being right. This is something we've talked about several times in recent years. Righteousness is more than simply wanting things to be made right. It's a difficult discipline in and of itself to seek the right. But righteousness is a term that describes less our position on issues and more our relationships. Theologically, to be righteous is to be in right relationship with God and with neighbor, with those around us. You know, that's why I say I think our culture has lost a hunger for righteousness. What is preferred now is to claim to be right on the issue of the day and to discount those on the other side of the issue of the day, maybe even to dehumanize them. That's not righteousness. That's self-righteousness. In Wendell Berry's novel, Jaber Crow, Jaber lives in Port William, Kentucky. It's an old farming community that is living through the pains and indignities of becoming a new farming community. Jaber was an orphan who found himself at the orphanage of the Good Shepherd where he thought he might be called to ministry and then he got wiser and became a barber and a church sexton and a grave digger in Port William. He never married, but he loved Maggie. 
Sadly for Jaber, Maggie was married to Troy. It was an ill-suited relationship. Troy was arrogant and selfish, and Jaber did not care for him at all. It was the 1960s, and the Vietnam War was raging, and there were protests in the streets about the war. Most folks in Port William considered the war protesters to be un-American, if, if not outright communists themselves. That's the way Troy thought about it. And one day, while he was waiting his turn in the barber chair, he said, well, if you ask me, we should just gather up all those war protesters and put them in front of the communists, and whoever kills who, it's all for the good. And Jaber stopped his trimming and said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Troy whipped his head around. Where did you get that? Jaber said, I got it from Jesus. Oh, Troy said. And then Jaber said to himself, that would have been a great expression of Christianity, except for I didn't love Troy. That's righteousness. It's not enough to be right. We have to be right and also love Troy. <laughs> to be right and to be attentive to relationship with those who think we're wrong, with those we might think are wrong. There's very little appetite for righteousness these days. It's so tempting to settle for being right and being divided, for being right and being isolated, for being right and even filled with condescension, but that's not righteousness, that's just self-righteousness. To hunger for righteousness, it's an acquired taste. But it might just restore community where it's fractured. Now, I get it. That might sound naive to you, but Jesus said it's blessed, that it pleases God. I think he's right, and like you, I'm trying to trust that he's right. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
We may not know exactly how to hunger and thirst for righteousness, but what we do know is that God has put in us a longing and a searching to be united with God and to be united with one another. Since the 1940s, psychologists have been doing study after study that illuminate our human need for close relationships. Researcher and counselor Dr. Susan Johnson tell us hundreds of studies show that positive, loving connections with others protect us, protect us from stress and help us to cope better with life's challenges and traumas. The science demonstrates that connecting with others has mental and physical effects on us. We, as Christians, know this already. We know that when we turn to God and when we turn to our neighbors, we can find the solace that we are seeking. We know that there is balm for our sick soul in Jesus Christ. So this Lent, this day, let us do what Jesus has already commanded us to do. Let us love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength, and let us love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen.
As we go from this time together, remember, just as the holy love of God called us into this time of worship, now that same holy love sends you out into God's beloved world, a world that is beautiful and a world that is broken. But go this day inspired by that love. Let it nourish a little hunger in you for all that has gone wrong to be made right in, in, in you and in this world. Let us be inspired by that holy love as we live toward God's promised day. Now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of God's Spirit rest and abide with us all now and forever. Amen.